Hey guys, Trey here. Uh, as you notice, our backdrop's a little different today than it has been in the past. Uh, that's because we've moved to my house uh, because I have access to the historical models of speaker in the La Scala, which is what we're going to cover today. These are actually my personal speakers. This one we pulled out of storage out of the bus, <laughs> but its mate is my center channel. And twin to this, which is a 70th anniversary, is my right and left main. Mid 70s, when I first had a chance to hear the La Scala. In fact, a chance to hear that La Scala. <laughs> it wasn't blue then, but that particular speaker. The school that I went to was a little small town outside of Hope, Arkansas, called Spring Hill, Arkansas. I think we had 350 kids, K through 12 at the time I was down there. They had these Lascalas stuck under the bleachers inside the old gym. An old PA head, powered PA head stuff. So we pulled those things out and I started to hook them up and we got a chance, my very first chance to hear a clipped speaker was at the gymnasium at school on the, a pair of the Lascalas. The other one is my center channel right now uh, in my home system. And um, from then on, we had audio it went during PE and during the gym. <laughs> Cats love clips. So from then on, we had sound in the at PE at, at school, and uh, I kind of ended up being the AV guy from then on <laughs> at school. So uh, I continued to listen to this product and got interested in it, and more interested in, in what things sounded like and why they sounded like, and. A good portion of that come because I had a chance to hear that pair of speakers. And you notice the woofer sitting on top of it. That's the tone standard from the early 80s, 1980, for the professional Klipsch La Scala. It's funny to say that, that it's a professional Klipsch La Scala is different than the ones behind me because in 1963, the La Scala was engineered to be a professional public address speaker. In 63, we're actually using this speaker as a portable speaker for Winthrop Proctor's gubernatorial race in the state of Arkansas. Was built and detailed the same way that his home speakers were built and detailed. The difference was it was in a carry around package at around 123 pounds. Had the K33J, it had a Jensen driver in it for the woofer. The mid-range horn was a K400 uh, aluminum horn, cast horn, with a K55V Atlas driver, and a K77 Electro Voice tweeter. Paul did his own network for that. He picked up parts similar to what he had in the, in the K-horn, as this speaker was basically a K-horn, minus the last third of the, or half of the low frequency cabinet. Low frequency cutoff is about 50 hertz, and the low frequency cutoff on the K-horn is 35 hertz and that last third of the horn is the part that actually gets you there. Moving forward in 1966, there was a network change, the crossover to a Type A from an original network. The woofers changed over the years. Uh, in 67, it changed to a 33M. Shortly after that, it went to the Paducah, Kentucky developed driver from CTS. Uh, it stayed that way for a little while. In 71, AA network was developed. They added the Zener diodes to give tweeter protection to help with some of the overpowering of the tweeter at high volumes. 74, the mid-range driver changed around for a short period of time because of access to the 55V. A little later, the uh, woofer from CTS was moved to the Brownsville, Texas development location. They used that for a few years. Shortly after that, the Eminence e-woofer that e-woofer was used in a good portion of, of the products that use that 15 inch. So having that woofer work across the board makes the product a lot more cost efficient. So that was the, the efficiency part of building products that Paul added to his products. The AA network, same way, a lot of the same parts all the way through the, through the different networks. The transformer, T2A transformer was the way to get one transformer to fit all the different uh, step downs for the different uh, mid-range horns. In 83, the AL crossover came into play. 
They steepened the slope and changed the filtering for the tweeter. Later in 83, they did the AL2 when they changed the mid-range driver, the M version of the mid-range driver because the Atlas version was not available at the time. Or they got a better deal or, or the response was better at the time or there was a reason for them to change that. And they also went to the 401 horn. And that's the, the molded plastic, if you will, uh, horn that's used today even. They had some problems with drift in the, in the drivers, meaning that the response of the drivers as they built those drivers over time changed. So the AL3 network was actually designed specifically for the 55M driver that was later in, in that year, uh, 1989, because of the drift in that driver's build. So people talk about grabbing a driver and sticking it in here because that's a better driver. Think about that. They had a complete driver, I mean network nomenclature change and put it in a different network just because the mid-range driver drifted in its standard operating range as a manufacturing piece. If you go grab a driver and stick in there, the likelihood of that driver to be the same as the drift of that mid-range on that dry network, very unlikely. Very unlikely. You get a little more give when you're dealing with the woofer. You can get a little bit wild with the woofer compared to the mid-range driver or the tweeter because of the capabilities of that LF horn and what it does and doesn't do. Uh, but man, you start changing mid-range tweeters and you run into problems. So this speaker being a 79, the way I ended up with this speaker is a uh, girl that I went to school with, great right ahead of me, reached out to me for the cheerleaders. They actually were using this blue speaker, hauling this thing around on a wagon uh, with a car stereo amplifier in the back and a little mixer with a microphone and they were doing their cheers through this La Scala. And I worked deal with them so that we traded the pair of La Scalas for a pair of KI-362s so that they could have a little smaller speaker and something a little easier to handle when they're moving in and off the field. And a little more durable for that matter because it had truck bed liner uh, sprayed on the cabinets so they couldn't hurt them really. So I saved these and being the first pair of Lascalas, the first pair of clip speakers that I had a chance to listen to, uh, I thought it was kind of cool for me to be able to bring these home and use them in my home system now. This woofer being a 1980 tone standard was probably a driver change for the La Scala when they went in the pro world. So in 1977, they Clip started building the pro products or industrial line products. And they had an industrial line La Scala. There was a change in the LF or the doghouse as they call it. If you took this part of the speaker out and set it up like that, so this was the ridge of the roof, it looked like Snoopy's doghouse. In 1977, they made a change for the pro doghouses. And the ones that had pro have a quarter inch groove cut into the edge of the board at the very back of this, this piece so that this basket can slide down in that slot to screw into the same holes that hold the standard woofer in. The reason for that is, is the basket's wider by a quarter inch. So you either have to cut an eighth inch slot in your speaker or take a flat grinding wheel and flatten off two sides in parallel <laughs> and take a quarter inch off the basket of the woofer because they just won't fit. This moves us up into the 2000s. They started having to change drivers because we run into driver issues. The K77M, uh, Electro Voice ceased production on it and on the 55M mid-range. So they went back to the K55V, called it the K55X, which is a new, new version of that driver, and put it back into production. The 77M tool was purchased by a third party and they retooled it and started producing that driver and Clips used that driver for a period of time. That's when the AL4 network was, was introduced to accommodate the new drivers. They uh, eliminated the Zener diodes in that unit, opting for a poly switch for protection for the tweeter. 
In December of 2005, I guess it was, the La Scala 2, as they call it, debuted, which was the La Scala that they started first building in the MDF instead of plywood. That's what this, this shape of cabinet and style of cabinet is. Then they went to a 70th anniversary, which is what this one is, which is like the La Scala 3, if you will, and that would be the La Scala 4. That's really the La Scala 2.5, and, and this is the La Scala 3. So, depending on how you want to look at it, I think Klipsch actually calls this a La Scala 3 with an AL5. Uh, because of the network changes, I believe, is how they designate between the units. The La Scala 2 was the first version of the speakers that had a split HFLF cabinet made of that wood. They retooled in 2006 the tweeter and eliminated the need for the L brackets added onto it and moved, made that part of the horn so the horn stuck through the, the cabinet. In 2016, they came out with the La Scala 2 70th anniversary. And that's what this is. I've, I've, I've always recalled the, the, the La Scala 3 because it was the third version of it, but they indicated it is the 70th anniversary for that. And, excuse me. <laughs> that brings us to the latest version of the Scala. This guy is extremely similar in makeup cabinet wise from the 70th anniversary. They took all the things that they did to make the 70th anniversary speaker special and moved it into this one. With this version of speaker, they changed the tweeter from the 77 to the 771, which is the new vented version of the compression driver, which helps on the distortion, lowers the distortion of that speaker, uh, of that part of the speaker, the driver. That, along with the 55X mid-range that they have in it now, gives this speaker extremely low distortion numbers, extremely low distortion numbers. And that's what's good about the Clips product. The thing about the La Scala and the Heritage line, and, or Clips line in general, is dynamic range. The capability of that speaker to go from smallest passages, smallest, quietest passages, to the largest, most dynamic passages without effort. And that is a hard thing to do for a lot of speakers, especially one that doesn't have the sensitivity and the efficiency of the Clips line. They came a long way from where this original PA speaker started. You know, they, they started out as a single speaker. Uh, it turned into a stereo pair fairly quickly from the metal horns to the change in the drivers to the uh, change in the cabinetry. The thing that hasn't changed is the DNA that Paul put into that speaker. Thanks for tuning in to Paducah Home Theater Television, PHT TV. Be sure and subscribe to the channel so that they can uh, continue doing this if you like it. I'm Trey and that's my 2DB. You know, Paul said we walk on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> I don't think I quite qualify, Jethro. <laughs>